Great. So let's get everything underway on time. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, we do invite you to mute your uh, microphones, and if it does help your internet connection today to turn off your camera, um, just because it is very media heavy, um, we're going to be sharing a lot of video content with you today, so it might help you to turn off your media, um, and then you might be able to see things a little bit better. So um, this is our second virtual site tour uh, delivered by your Conservation Areas Workshop. Uh, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time today to join us. Uh, there's no rigorous involvement today. There's no surprise breakout rooms. Um, just enjoy it uh, and celebrate some of the fantastic CAs within our collective. Uh, the workshop committee has really been um, looking forward to this. Uh, Dave's here with me, as always, to ensure everything runs seamlessly and to give me nods of reassurance. Uh, mine will be the voice you hear moderating this webinar. Um, I'm Tori Fisher. I'm our Conservation Parks Administrator, and Dave Orr is Senior Specialist of Enforcement. Both of us have the pleasure of working for Credit Valley Conservation, and we've shared the responsibility of uh, co-chairing the workshop for the past two years, alongside our delightful and talented committee who are in the audience watching. So at this time, uh, we'd like to turn our attention to John Messman, Team Lead of Community Lands and Outreach with South Nation Conservation Authority and CA Workshop Committee member for our land acknowledgement. Thanks, Tori. As we gather today virtually across what is now known as Canada, we want to first turn our minds to acknowledge and thank the many Indigenous nations on whose traditional and treaty territory we live and work. We encourage you to take a moment to position yourselves on the map depicted on the screen and to look beyond government resources for more information on traditional and treaty relationships in your area. As a collective, we recognize and deeply appreciate the relationship, past and present, that Indigenous nations have with the lands and waters. We acknowledge that Indigenous practices of land stewardship have created the clean waters and healthy forests meadows and wetlands that benefit and enrich the lives of all Canadians. We recognize our own responsibility to protect and steward the environment for future generations. We also recognize and affirm our responsibility to uphold the 94 calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission through our work. Miigwech, Anishik, merci, Niawe, Swank, Miigwech, Merci and thank you. Thanks, John. Sorry, a bit of a preemptive slide switch. Um, so this year we've been title sponsored by MSD Inc., uh, Let's Camp, Easy Doc, and Gumac Inc., who have generously offered their resources to fund the development opportunities the CA workshop brings. Few uh, housekeeping items to share with you. Um, there is no public chat feature available during this webinar, and we won't be doing a Q&A during this webinar uh, live. Alternatively, we do invite participants to enter your questions into the Q&A feature addressed to a specific presenter, and presenters will have, um, have generously offered to follow up with any questions post-webinar. And finally, uh, please stay tuned after the virtual site tours have concluded. Um, is we have a very special uh, giveaway uh, generously donated to the workshop this year. So we will be picking one person on this webinar to claim the prize. So you must be on the webinar to accept. If not, we're going to pick somebody else who is. Okay, so uh, we all know that site tours have been an essential piece of the workshop for years. Um, they're a chance to actually get out of your parks and see what other CAs are doing. Uh, special projects they've got on the go, um, neat amenities you might have never seen before. Um, so this year we had four CAs rise to the occasion, and I really do mean rise to the occasion. Um, thank you sincerely to our presenters for crafting unique presentations for, for each of us to visit your parks and projects. It's not easy. Um, you can imagine your calendar and then somebody asks you to make a video <laughs> on the side. <laughs> so. You know what? Everybody came through and we're very grateful. 
Uh, before we kick off our first presenter, uh, a quick commercial from our first title sponsor, EasyDoc, uh, with a neat solution for your wetland trail boardwalk needs. Just a second. <laughs> We're gonna <laughs> okay. Start. Dave had it all queued up, but uh just left the meeting briefly. So let's see which one of us brings it up first. You got it. I don't hear any volume. Looks like Dave still got himself muted, just like a repeat of last workshop, just testing us all, maybe. Yep. Okay, we'll get this right. Just a moment here. Okay, off to a little bit of a rocky start. Um, so let's keep moving on. Um, we'd like to welcome uh, Hamilton Conservation Authority with Gord Costi, uh, Director of Conservation Area Services, uh, and Kendrick Margerison. Um, I don't know who, if you're on the call, I think you are, but, and I hope I got your last name right. Um, she's the social media and graphic assistant um, and video editor extraordinaire. Welcome guys. Hey, thanks very much, Tori, uh, Dave, committee members, uh, everyone joining in today. It's uh, it's definitely our pleasure to represent Hamilton Conservation Authority here for the Conservation Areas Workshop. And we've been doing this back and forth for quite some time now. And Geneva Park, a lot of us will remember and now a couple times virtual. So uh, just before Tori, I step into setup for this video for Hamilton Conservation Authority, I got a couple of thank yous I want to put out there because you know I want to give this back and I love giving this back to the Conservation Areas Workshop Committee because without you guys, we wouldn't be here. Let, let's be honest about that. And also to the attendees today that are, that are listening in, that are watching in, perhaps going to watch us later. We've got so much shared experience. Um, and uh, um, sharing that, I, I really, truly hope the workshop here succeeds for years to come. And here at Hamilton, I just want to give a shout out to uh, 
our director of capital projects, Matt Hall. He's not with us here for the video. Kendra uh, Majerison is here and Kendra, she directed, she edited, and she shot this video for us to make us look really good. Uh, so let me jump to the setup, Tori, uh, for our video. And because I, I want to provide just a little bit of that information for the group here that isn't contained in our short video. Um, and this video here, it's not showing a completed project, it's showing construction in progress, a major capital works program for Hampton Conservation Authority. And you don't see this level of um, investment, definitely not investment in one conservation area very often. Uh, this is really a, it's a true career and legacy uh, project that's gonna last here for decades on end. And uh, to the group that's uh, joined with us today, uh, I just wanna tell you sometimes as true as what they say, patience is truly a virtue. This was a long term idea that we had out there. Uh, you'll hear it went back to our 1988 master plan. But while we were being patient, we came up with a better location. We came up with a better project idea and we came up with more buy in. So uh, what we are witnessing today is it's transformational right in front of our eyes. And you guys are really going to love this. I think uh, when completed these cabins that you're going to see for Hamilton Conservation Authority, the Dremlin cabins, we're going to have them rented out uh, $135 for the small ones, $160 per night for the large ones. And we do anticipate great uh, interest and great pickup for these. Um, the cabins are also going to be available to rent 365. Uh, they've got running water. They got a two piece uh, uh, bathroom facility inside of them. It was not easy, Tori. We we struggled to get all of these approvals in place. It, it was much harder than the video, although I did find the video a little bit harder than I thought. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Tori, I just you're on my screen here to uh, uh, just to let people know that uh, this is the Hamilton Conservation Authority experience. I really think this video is going to tell a much better story than what I've been able to share with you guys here today. Our email addresses follow the video, so you'll be able to see contacts from myself, from Matt Hall, and uh, so Tori, Dave, if you guys are still listening in, let's roll the tape and let's see Valens Lake Conservation Area and the Drumlin Cabin. So thank you everybody and uh, enjoy this short video. Hey everybody, welcome to your CA workshop. I'm Gord Costi and I'm the Director of Conservation Area Services for Hamilton Conservation Authority. And today it's our pleasure to showcase beautiful Valens Lake Conservation Area and HCA's newest venture, the 365 Drumlin Cabins. So if your conservation authorities ever considered getting into the roof accommodation business, then today's gonna to be a great day. We're gonna catch up with Matt Hall. He's the director of capital projects, and that's in charge of the design, the trades and the construction crew that built these beautiful cabins. Hey Matt, thanks for joining us. And you know, it's been such a journey, these cabins and trying to get from the 1988 master plan to construction today. So can you just describe the three different uses that we're using for the cabin layout? Sure. Yeah, so when we had originally planned the cabins out, we've got a series of six smaller cabins um, and a larger pavilion structure that was pre-existing on the site that we looked at uh, enclosing and utilizing as part of the cabin site. So on on the more private side of the pavilion, we've got two cabins. They've got uh, the ability to have two people in them. We look at them as almost like a couple's cabin that, uh, that could be rented out for people. The pavilion itself, we're gonna be enclosing into two larger cabins. It's joined with one another, but there's gonna be soundproof walls in between both units and, uh, and available to be rented out for larger families. Uh, we're planning on having the ability to sleep up to six people in each one of those units. And then of course, as we move to the other side of the pavilion conversion, we've got a series of four smaller cabins again. And these ones we view as more family, uh, family oriented as well, smaller families. We are planning on having the ability to sleep up to, up to four people in each one. Um, so 
it should suit the needs of, of most people nicely. Yeah, it's going to be great. And, uh, you know, we're still in construction mode, and the guys are over here, and they're working hard. What's some of the final uh, steps that we're going to be looking for? towards uh, as we near substantial completion. Uh, we're hopeful that now that we're focused on one particular area instead of spreading ourselves out across the entire site on all, this, all the other six cabins that we can continue with that work a little bit uh, more quickly and uh, get us uh, get all the walls enclosed before the winter sets upon us and then we can finish off interior works throughout the winter season itself. After that, we're planning on some minor landscaping work to be done here. And after that, we do have plans to improve our parking area to the cabins. We're going to try to uh, arrange it so that it's a bit more of a, a private uh, spot so that it doesn't impact the people that are ca uh, camping within the cabins themselves on a nightly basis. So there will be some additional improvements to come along the way there. Well, we've got a great view here too. Look out the front door, you're overlooking the upper reservoir, the Valens Lake. Look out the back and you're overlooking the Valens wetland. But what we really want to see, let's, let's take a sneak peek inside and kind of see what the inside of the cabins look like. So the rest of the areas of the cabin that we've got, uh, this is going to be the dining area itself. We've got room for a table and chairs. Uh, as we move along through here, we've got room for a toilet and a sink there. As we move into the back area, this is going to be the sleeping area. A lot of room, beautiful view at the back, beautiful view at the front. And one of the things that we've done along the way is actually vault the ceilings in each one. So it gives us a little bit more of a height. Um, we did that with, uh, with scissor trusses instead of a traditional roof rafter system. And that allowed us to get, you know, a little bit more height gives you a little bit more uh, sense of space inside of the cabins as well and um, and really opens things up. Along with the amount of windows that we have in the cabins, you get a beautiful view from whatever direction you're going to be looking out. Yeah, I really think the families are going to love it. I mean, the fun is really on the outside of these cabins. That's where they'll be spending their time in those activity areas, uh, having their campfires, doing their uh, cooking outdoors. So we're looking forward to it. Absolutely. We really just have one more segment we want you. We want to get a couple thank yous out there. We want to thank the uh, CA Workshop Committee for allowing Hamilton Conservation Authority to show our cabin project to everyone. And also to thank the viewers for, for sitting here with us, learning through our experience. And one last thing we got to do, Matt, is we just have to cue the music and roll the credits. So, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gord and Team Hamilton, uh, for that special sneak peek. Uh, truly something unique in a conservation area, that's for sure. Um, so thanks so much for sharing it with us. And I mean, I'd be there in a heartbeat, as I'm sure many others will. I, you know, you're going to be booked from stem to tail. So <laughs> thanks so much, you guys. Thanks very much, Tori. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Uh, in working with our uh, seeming technical difficulties, let me just bring up. Um, our next commercial from our second presenting sponsor. Spending time with family. It means family dinners, hot dogs, campfires. It means s'mores. Spending time on the beach. Eating salt and vinegar chips on the sand specifically. Going hiking. It means trail mix. Is all you think about is food? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that is um, Let's Camp. Uh, 
So they are a unique uh, camping reservation software that is sweeping the province. Okay, next up, um, we want to welcome Team Nottawasaga Valley uh, and their virtual site tour. Uh, so we want to welcome Kyra Howes, who is the manager of lands and uh, operations, and her team. Thanks for joining us today, guys. Thanks, Tori. So I also wanted to say uh, thanks to the <clears throat> Conservation Area Workshop Planning Committee. These virtual webinars have been a really great way to connect with all of our colleagues, conservation authorities across Ontario when we can't meet in person. Uh, and I really hope they continue even when we do head back to Geneva Park or other locations to meet in person, because I think they're really great if we're not able to uh, to all make it out. Um, and Gord, let us know whenever you start taking reservations, by the way, because I think you know, we've got a good, uh, good slew of people who are interested in renting your cabins. Um, Next on the thank you list, uh, of course, to our, our our team, our lands team. So Clint, Mike, Sensor, Byron, and especially Maria, who really pulled this video together. Um, Maria kind of got wrapped into it. Um, yes, I don't think she knew what she was getting herself into whenever she first uh, said she would help out. So thank you very much, Maria, for that. Um, so the premise of the video started when we were developing content for curriculum based videos focusing on our Fort Willow conservation area. So every year we had hosted a festival which gave grade seven students the opportunity to see reenactors and learn about this historic location. So it kind of spiraled from there. And um, yeah, I think I think it's going to be pretty interesting. It's a little bit different than what Gord had presented, but I hope hopefully it'll be uh, interesting and entertaining. Go ahead, Tori. Okay. All right, let me get it all set up here. Not that. All right, let me just that. Okay. Hi. Welcome to the Nottawasega Valley Conservation Authority's Fort Willow Conservation Area. Today we're going to take a tour of Fort Willow and the Menacing Wetlands Conservation Area. Come with us and we'll show you around. So welcome to historic Fort Willow. Walk through these gates and take yourself back 200 years to a time when soldiers, coopers, blacksmiths, indigenous people all came together to fight for the common good and survive in a pretty harsh part of Ontario back in the early 1800s. So back in the uh, early 1970s, uh, this property was owned by the Berry Chamber of Commerce. And after uh, a couple of years of negotiations, it was eventually um, donated to the NVCA. Um, they, they knew that, you know, we had a land acquisition program at the time. Uh, there was, there was this local knowledge uh, and the knowledge of historians that uh, there was a real historical significance of the property. And so the idea was that we would acquire the land and we would protect it uh, because it's it being um, bordering the menacing wetlands, obviously uh, there's there's an ecological perspective as well. So at the end of the day, we acquired, I think it's about uh, 10 acres and uh, yeah, we, we just managed it as a, uh, a natural area for many, many years. 20 years after acquiring it, uh, we were approached by a group of uh, retired gentlemen that uh, had this vision of um, rekindling the sparks of historic Fort Willow. Um, it, you know, word was out then uh, quite broadly that um, this was a very strategic military depot during the War of 1812. And so their mission was to, uh, you know, res resurrect this place. Um, it was basically uh, an overgrown cow pasture, a lot of young saplings, poplar and whatnot. So it didn't look anything like you see it today. It was, um, you know, a, a woodlot that um, required a lot of work, and uh, they did that. It took. It was 10 years. Their their project took them. Uh, all volunteer, uh, donated materials, etc. Um, they did a lot of work at the. Um, Simcoe County Museum in the archives. They looked at a lot of the old archaeological um, uh, records and uh, we brought in a surveyor and um, we put in these timbers. We didn't want to put in any buildings because 
it's out in the middle of nowhere and, and vandalism is, is a problem as uh, our viewers will know. And um, so we just put in these outlines and just gives people uh, an idea of what life used to be here. You know, we've got the, the block house, the blacksmiths, the, the stables, the cookhouse, etc. So that that's it's it's just kind of grown from there, where we now have accessible trails, and uh, it's it's just it's it's just really started to take on a life of its own. The palisade. I mean, this is what obviously would a a palisade around a, a fort back in the day would have looked like. Uh, the jury is still out on whether or not there actually was a palisade here, um, but. Wilford Drury, no pun intended, his his, his drawings uh, or notes did show a some type of a palisade around the fort encampment, and so the volunteers took it upon themselves to put in this 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 lovely uh, wooden structure that really gives you that feeling of uh, hey this is you know we're, we've really stepped back in time here. I mean there are a lot of forts in Canada that look like this, and so that's why we've uh, we've erected this one. The original group that uh, came on site was, they, they called themselves the Fort Willow Improvement Group. And they were uh, a, gr a group of retired farmers, basically, that just brought this place back to life the way you see it now. So 10 years after they, uh, after they finished their project, we then morphed into a group called Friends of Historic Fort Willow. This group is a different makeup. They're largely all reenactors, indigenous people, soldiers in, from the War of 1812, sailors, etc. They love to come here in full costume and they, they really bring a lot of color to the property. So that's worked well for us. You know, we have a festival each year called the Festival of Fort Willow, where we'll see a thousand people coming through here on uh, any given Saturday and uh, just educating the public on life during uh, the early 1800s and during wartime, etc. So yeah, it's uh, it's worked out well. Two different two different dynamics uh, these groups were, and um, it's been it's been a challenge, but very interesting, very rewarding to work with both of them. Hi there, I'm Trevor Carter. I'm a high school teacher at St. Joseph's High School in Barrie, but I'm also a licensed archeologist with the Ministry of Tourism and Culture and Sport. And today we're here at Fort Willow, War of 1812 reconstructed archeological site, a real archeological site. And I bring my students from grade 12 out here for um, annual and semi-annual excavations here at Fort Willow for actual digs um, here at the fort. The process of excavating is kind of surprising to students sometimes. Maybe they expect to get a shovel and dig right in, but we're very meticulous. We're very careful in how we excavate. We use a trowel, for example, this small tool here. And some of the students will dig deeper than themselves, almost five or six feet down, just scraping. One small scrape at a time. We don't want to miss any artifacts. It's not like you see on TV or on um, Indiana Jones or in a movie where you're finding really big artifacts. Usually the bulk of what we find are very, very small items. But thanks to all these little items that we find, we can slowly put back together the story of Fort Willow. It's almost like a, um, uh, a crime scene or, or a detective story where little small clues can lead to a full story. That's what we do here. It's a very slow process, but bit by bit, here we are at a reconstructed site based mostly on archaeological finds. What you see behind me here are these outlines on the ground. These are the outlines of buildings that were found archaeologically from a previous archaeologist in 1959 who came here, Wilfred Jury. But the whole area is all reconstructed thanks to archaeology. These buildings would have been supply centers. This fort was built for supplies coming up from Toronto, from York, just in case of any attack from the Americans, we could get some supplies around the Great Lakes using this area here. So it's very important for the War of 1812 that this place be here for these supplies. But the building you see behind us here, that's all based, the outlines are all based on archeological work. These particular buildings I'm standing next to, we think were the officers quarters. The officers were the upper class members of the, of the military, and these buildings were made for them. Now, why do we think so? We think this, first of all, the archaeologist in 1959 believed this because of the artifacts he had found, but we have one problem. The archaeologist from that time didn't leave any reports for us to investigate why he thinks this is the officer's quarter. So one of the reasons we're back here with my students from St. Joseph's High School, the grade 12 students, they get credit for this course. We come here and we excavate to try to see if we can confirm 
what the previous archaeologists found. We're very lucky. He didn't excavate everything. There's lots for us to find. We get an average of about two or 3,000 artifacts every year. And looking at those artifacts and where they're found, we can say, yes, this actually is the officer's quarters, or maybe not. In this case, we did find evidence for the officer's quarters. The artifacts here support this conclusion. Some of the things we have found, for example, um, parts of the weapons from the soldiers. This is part of a musket, it's called a gun flint, and it makes the spark that ignites your gunpowder and then fires your weapon. These were found in this area where the officers, you would expect them to be with their weapons, we find that here. What comes out of the gun after you fire it out of the musket? A lead ball. And this is an actual artifact that we found here. This is a lead musket ball. It's made of lead. It's very heavy. It's too bad you couldn't, couldn't touch it yourself. You'd see it's very heavy. Um, we have found larger projectiles as well, not just lead balls from the muskets or the pistols. We've also found something called grape shot. I wish I had it here for you. It's much larger, about the size of a very, very large grape. They would put these in a net or a thin tin can, put it into a cannon and fire it. And when you fire the cannon, the net tears apart or the can breaks apart. And these large grape-sized metal balls fly in every direction. So you can take out lots of people if there's an invading force. You can take out a lot of people with that in one shot. We found that here too. So evidence for the military is very, very commonplace here that we find for the military presence. We also find, this will be very difficult to see, we also find buttons. The uniform buttons the soldiers wore usually told you the regiment that they were part of. In this case here, it's the, we found a button here in 2007 from the 68th Regiment, which we know was stationed in Upper Canada after the War of 1812. But this site continued to ha have a military presence even after the War of 1812 was over. And this particular regiment spent time up in Petitanguishene as well. The lead musket balls, that, that we find here, sometimes they're pre-made, but often the soldiers made their own. And so what do we find here at the fort? Evidence for them making their own musket balls. This strange looking little blob here is actually melted lead. The soldiers would melt lead over a campfire and pour it into a mold to make their own musket balls. And we have evidence of that here as well. So we find the complete musket balls and the evidence of manufacture. All that makes sense for a military site and for the officer's quarters. So how would we know if this is the officer's quarters or a soldier's area? Just finding musket balls and pieces of weapons isn't enough. We have to have, find something we can use to compare the two people. We know the officers are upper class. They're gonna be able to afford more expensive things than the average soldier. And one of the key things that can tell you someone's wealth at that time in the early 1800s is the kind of ceramic they eat off of. Today, you might look at someone's car, look at their SUV or a, a small compact car. They get an idea of how wealthy someone might be. Back then, it was quite often ceramic. This ceramic here, in this photograph, this is a, it's a piece of a plate, a, di a dinner plate. This was found here in the officer's quarters, and you can see the fine detail of the, the woman and her dress in this. This was not hand-painted. This was made in a, essentially, a printing process. It was an industrial method of making, mass-producing these types of plates. These were more expensive, believe it or not, than this type of ceramic here. It's hard to see what you're looking at here, but it's hand-painted flowers on some ceramic. Today, if you ask, uh, ask people who are out to buy some ceramic for their home, they'll want hand-painted. They'll think that's beautiful. This is exactly what I want to have for my home. It's, it's much more expensive to buy hand-painted ceramic. Not the case back then. Hand-painted was viewed as cheap ceramic. This is what we would tend to find more in the soldiers area. The officers wanted this new idea, this printed ceramic, and that's what you see here. We found more of this in the officers' area. Far across the archaeological site is the soldiers' area. They stayed pretty far away from where the officers were, very distinct regions. And we found a lot more hand-painted ceramic in the soldiers' area. So using just ceramics, comparing the types that we're finding, we can confirm what the previous archaeologists thought, that this was the officers' area and not a place for the lower-class soldier. So because the Fort Willow is a historic site, we try to uh, commemorate that with some of the construction projects we do here. Um, and a great example of that is this beamwork we've done here to hold up a cauldron. 
Um, we try to both in the materials we use here and in the construction methods uh, keep things as traditional and historically as we can. So for instance, with this beam work here, we've actually done traditional wood joinery. Um, an example of that would be a mortise and tenon joint. So what a mortise and tenon is, is at the top of this beam here, you have what has been notched down to a smaller size and that's the tenon. And then the tenon fits inside of a notch made the same size in the top beam. So they fit together nicely. And then you would drill through and put a wood dowel to hold it all together. Now, once that dowel is put in place, that will never move and it is a solid uh, form of wood joinery. So that's actually what we've done up here. So this great big beam here goes up inside of that beam there and is held together with strictly with dowels and wood so we are not using any um, you know modern hardware we are doing things the way they would have built things back in the day uh, another feature of this would be the fact that when you buy lumber these days it all comes perfectly smooth rounded off edges all milled properly well when the things would have been built they would have been using axes all by hand uh, would have been rough edges and everything so what we do is we take axes or we take planers, things like that when a project is done and we try to rough up the beams to kind of make it look more historically accurate. Um, another thing we sometimes have to do, just for safety purposes, we will have to use some modern day uh, technologies or materials. For instance, this one is actually sitting on concrete bases. Uh, when we do any digging in the, in the historic Fort Willow, we always make sure to save all of the dirt. We always dig by hand to make sure that we are not disturbing the soil as much as possible. Anything that comes out of the ground is actually saved for our archeologists to sift through to see if there's any artifacts within that. So we try to have as low of uh, an impact on the ground as possible when we are constructing things. Um, we all, when we do have to use modern day uh, materials and construction methods, uh, we do try to hide that as much as possible when we are done. So for instance, you'll notice here we have what it looks like wood dowels holding these in. In fact, what we had to do here was use great big lags in behind here uh, and a few screws as well inlaid here to hold it all together. We try to hide all of that with some wood dowel after the fact so that it's not visible to the public. So just as important as uh, using building me methods to keep things historically accurate, it's actually choosing the materials themselves can be just as important. So an example here would be uh, a shed here that we have actual sh cedar shake shingles on as the material for the roofing. Uh, modern day things like asphalt shingles, metal roofing weren't used back in the day. So this is uh, a, a way of keeping things historically accurate uh, around the property. Another way we try to keep the, uh, the construction projects uh, low impact on the property is actually the way we build our trails here. So for instance, you'll see I'm standing in a low-lying spot that's low elevation uh, and it's basically undisturbed ground here. Well, right around me is our trail system and you'll notice as I move forward, I'm coming up. It's in this elevated trail system. The reason we do this is on an average property, all we would do is go around with some heavy machinery, um, chew up what the old trail material is uh, and then try and smooth it back out where in here we did not want to disturb the ground beneath the trail itself so we actually built it up with limestone screenings as opposed to disturbing the ground underneath. The Fort Willow Conservation Area is located just up the hill from menacing wetlands. Historically people would have transported goods and materials from Lake Simcoe through Fort Willow down the Nottawasaga River and into Georgian Bay. So back uh, after the war uh, of 1812 had ended um, patriots or veterans of the uh, of that war coming back to Canada they were given plots of land and uh, it wasn't uh, real prime land uh, a lot of it was in the middle of uh, what was known as menacing swamp so um, what uh, started was a small community uh, actually named McKinnon settlement and it's actually within the southwestern area of menacing and uh, it's not not there any longer but there was a kind of a I guess you'd call it a thriving little agricultural community back in the 1900s 1910 1920 type thing and um, 
It wasn't sustainable, obviously, uh, during the, the floods, which were they can be extreme down in Minnesota. We'll see, we'll see waters, you know, elevating a couple of meters minimum. Uh, a lot of these farmers, they would have to take their livestock to the to the top floor of the barn. They'd have to take their furniture to the top floor in the house, and that, that was kind of life as it was in McKinnon Settlement. About 40 years ago, 45 years ago, um, NVCA and Nature Conserves to Canada entered into a into a partnership where lands were uh, purchased and or acquired through donation uh, within Minnesing Wetlands. This is one of the longer uh, land acquisition partnerships uh, that either agencies have taken part in. And uh, of the wetlands, uh, 13,000 acres, um, we now uh, own and manage 12,000 acres. So it's been a real success story. And you know, some of these were parcels of 20 acres, parcels of 100 acres. 3,000 acres, whatever the case may be, it's all been kind of uh, um, put together, and uh, and and it's now there for the um, recreation and uh, use by the general public, which sees a, lo a lot of, of visitors. So we're standing just um, on the edge of uh, the Lake Payette shoreline. Uh, down behind me, uh, we, we drop considerably down to Minnesota wetlands and there are various uh, little ecosystems throughout this entire wetland. It's it's very interesting in where you're seeing, because it's a, um, a, a waterfall staging area, we'll see all kinds of waterfalls. Sometimes the skies are black with ducks and geese, swans, and um, now we have eagle, the uh, bald eagles. Uh, they're they're pretty common. So beyond the birds, uh, you're seeing a lot of uh, dead silver maple forest. It's almost um, prehistoric in some ways, especially when you're you're going through and, and you'll see 20 or 30 uh, great blue herons that look like pterodactyls sometimes as you're uh, as you're cruising through the wetland. So that that's a highlight of the spring tours and uh, any other time of year, obviously the, the the leaves changing this time of year, that's very popular with with our visitors. And then throughout the summer, I mean, we have the Mad, we have the Willow Creek and then we have the Nautilus Saga. So there's there's lots of opportunity for, for different waterways to travel on. The wetland is made up of uh, various different types of, uh, of wetland. You know, we, we've got our fens, we've got the uh, a kind of a, a boreal forest, we've got our Carolinian forest. It's it's a real mix up of different ecotypes uh, or ecosystems. And um, that has really brought out the interest from scientists, uh, universities, and obviously uh, people just wanting to come in and see what's, what's to offer. Hello, my name is Vanessa Kennedy and I am from Wissaxian First Nation and I am here to talk about um, the role that First Nations people played in the War of 1812 and also the Nine Mile Portage. Uh, so the Nine Mile Portage would have been used by First Nations um, a long time ago before War of 1812 or even before um, the fur trade happened. The only way to travel back in the day was a uh, canoe and you had to find portage to see to get to the next waterway. So um, Indigenous people would have traveled this way from Lake Simcoe um, up this way and then obviously to the next um, waterway that they could get to. Again, traveling further up north to the next Great Lake. Um, and this was traveled heavily by um, the um, Three Fires Confederacy, which was the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the, the Odawa. Also by the Wendat pre-Iroquois Confederacy. Again, they would have they would have traveled this road as well. So along this trade um, route, things would have been traded um, pre-contact, and the things that would have been traded pre-contact between First Nations people were shells. Shells were very revered. Um, so this large shell is an abalone shell, and it comes from the West Coast. And with that would have been shards of shells, which is abalone as well, again, from the West Coast. It would have made its way through here at some point in time. Um, other shells that would have been collected um, along the way Again, you could have found them um, in and around this area. Um, dentillium would have been traded as well. Again, that was um, a shell that was used on um, a lot of uh, traditional regalia from Indigenous people. Um, another thing that would have been traded was um, tobacco. Tobacco was very, um, a very huge commodity in trade um, pre-contact. Um, and this is um, 
obviously tobacco, not commercial tobacco today. <laughs> um, sage also would have been traded. Um, this sage comes from all the way from California. So this is what they call white buffalo sage. Again, that would have been traded down in this area. Another hot commodity was um, this actual root, which is called bear root, and it's actually grown in the Appalachians. So it would have come all the way down from the Appalachians, all the way up this way. And it would have made this, its way up this way, further up, further north. Um, this was a, a very sought after medicine was bear root. And along this area, I have not walked in the Nine Mile Portage myself, but um, <laughs> I would assume there would have been tree markers um, along the way, again, marking the, the territory. Um, tree markers were used on many footpaths. Um, again, it, it was a tree marker that would show you if you were gonna turn left or right. Tree marker was a young sapling usually, and it was tied down. And if it was tied to the left, it means you took the left. And if it was tied down to the right, you took the right trail. Sometimes you came to a fourth. They were both tied down, so you could either go right or left. If you knew the footpath, then you obviously knew which way to go. Um, but a lot of the times you used guides. Um, again, after when uh, contact happened, um, a lot of Indigenous people were guides. So they took um, fur traders up, up this route. And that's how they would find their way through is through tree, uh, tree markers um, along the footpaths. Welcome everyone to the Willow Creek Canoe Corral. This is on the eastern end of the Minnesing wetlands. And uh, one of the main access points for some of the recreation activities here in uh, the wetlands. Um, Minnesing wetlands, it's, it's fed by several different rivers and tributaries, creeks, uh, but one of the main ones is the Nottawasauga River, of course. Uh, it starts over near Orange, Orangeville and then sort of wiggles its way through the center of our watershed and then exits the wetlands near Edenvale and then wiggles its way out towards um, Wasega Beach and into Georgian Bay. The Minnesing Wetlands is one of our most important pieces of flood control infrastructure that we have um, available to us. It uh, being in the center of our watershed and one of the main drain points for all the tributaries, it collects and stores and slowly releases a whole ton of our water that we, we get and without it a lot of places would be underwater. Because this spot here has so much changing water levels, it could be up to eight feet depending on uh, how much snowpack and spring melt and all that sort of stuff. It creates all of these different areas that are sort of untouched by, by us humans and it's just an open natural spot for all of these creatures and everything to make their homes. Menacing wetlands, it's, it's an extremely sort of changing environment uh, as far as water level goes. Um, and because of that, it's, it's kind of a place where we need to focus on uh, managing passively. So we manage it for passive recreation, um, for things like snowshoeing, uh, cross-country skiing in the wintertime, and in the summertime, canoeing and kayaking. Uh, we have a couple small hiking trails um, at the southern end, uh, near what we call the Lookout Tower, and here at the Canoe Corral, uh, which we are only able to mow for a good part of the year, but not all year. Uh, early spring, often the trails are flooded, and usually in the late fall, once we start to get some more rain, they'll flood again and we kind of have to leave them for the year. There were very few trees around this bird tower, uh, meadowy area, uh, but you had to have a really good set of binoculars to be able to see and actually watch the birds. Uh, so this was a bit of a rehabilitation. This spot where our tower is um, was a farm at one point that uh, people had to give up on um, and I think donated to us. Uh, but this was a field and it would have been flooded every year. We ended up bringing in some larger equipment, dug some holes and you know, we have a few bird watching ponds. We brought the wetlands to the tower. The, the tricky things about the menacing wetlands is that with our fluctuating water levels, um, the, the creek path and we essentially end up with almost a lake setting further down the creek here. It, it becomes a spot where people can get lost really easily. Uh, so we always recommend that you, you come well prepared with a plan because you don't want to be the person that runs out of water or can't paddle back against the current or just didn't even bring a map or a compass to begin with or stays out too late because it turns into a really uh, expensive uh, rescue operation between 
uh, fire crew and helicopters and boats going down the creek. It, it's just a bill you don't want to have to pay at the end of the day of a nice canoe ride. We offer hunting on our properties as part of a recreational option. Uh, mainly in the menacing wetlands. Some of the main benefits uh, for hunting is um, social aspect, um, you know, physical activity, um, ov overall mental health. I see a lot of um, parents bringing out their kids um, and you know sometimes I'll, I'll come across families uh, of three generations that have been hunting in the menacing wetlands their whole lives so it's uh, kind of nice to see um, grandparents and parents passing it down to uh, to their kids. The hunters are stewards of the land. They provide eyes and ears uh, for us um, because we don't have the opportunity of being out in menacing all the time. So the, uh, the hunters do provide us with a lot of information um, that's useful. Sometimes they report um, animals that aren't uh, normally seen. Uh, so we've had reports of, of uh, moose in the menacing wetland, which is uh, pretty far south for, for moose. Um, a lot of times they'll report um, illegal activity and that allows us to, to go out and uh, deal with it appropriately. We offer 100 permits to resident and non-resident people for our watershed. Uh, the main reason why we, we cap it off at 100 is because of harvest numbers and uh, to keep basically the impact uh, to, a, to a minimum uh, in, in menacing. When they are out on our property though, they, um, you know, obviously they have to abide by MNR rules and regulations in regards to uh, to licensing and tagging, um, but you know we also incorporate some of our own rules while they're out on our properties uh, to keep impact uh, to a minimum. Part of the Conservation Authorities Act, um, you know, there's no removal, destruction, or anything like that of any plant, animal, and whatnot. So that that's sort of written in our rules, but I mean. Um, uh, we make that aware to the hunters when they come in and get their permit. And uh, some of the rules obviously are like, you know, no ATVing, um, you know, for, for pulling your, your animal out. Uh, 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 another big one that we don't promote is, is any vegetation trimming, like, um, you know, for sight lines or shooting lanes or anything like that. So um, hunting uh, on our properties, the impact is kept to a minimum. Also, we, uh, we don't allow people to build any uh, permanent tree stands. So we only allow temporary, um, uh, basically, ladder tree stands that have to be removed after hunting season. And uh, th that also uh, keeps uh, impact to a minimum. The non-permanent tree stands, like the ladder stands that we allow, um, essentially are you know ratchet strapped to uh, the tree. And uh, once um, hunting season's over, uh, the, uh, the hunters to remove them um, afterwards. So there's no or little impact at all. The Nottawa Saga Valley Conservation Authority uses an online payment system called the McKay Pay app. Visitors to our Conservation Authorities can use the McKay system to pay remotely at all of our conservation areas. It's important for our guests to pay for parking, to help with trail maintenance, infrastructure development, and help maintain our conservation areas. Thank you for joining our conservation area tour. We hope you enjoyed it. We look forward to having you out and enjoying our trails someday soon. Hi, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kyra, um, for such an amazing uh, video tour. I feel like I've been to your CAs. <laughs> I mean, not that it's gonna restrict me from going on my own time, but it was just such a great, like the, the education and everything else, just you guys really pulled it together with, uh, and your whole crew being able to see everybody. Um, I know I used to work with Spencer McDonald, so it's really neat seeing him on camera with such a long, long beard <laughs> it's very cool so thank you guys very much thanks Drake. okay 
So um, we're going to move on here. I uh, just have a third um, presenting sponsor commercial to play for you guys now. I'm going to queue that up seamlessly as if nothing's happening behind the scenes. Explore the newest in picking table designs by MSD Inc., including complete aluminum models with perforated table decks and seats, and our eight foot long wheelchair accessible picking tables. While accessible on both ends, they can also be used as a standard table as the benches and table measure the same length. Visit www.sgate.ca for more information. That's www.sgate.ca. And most of all, thanks to all the conservation authorities for their continuous orders. We sincerely appreciate your business. All the best from the MSD team. Perfect. All right, we're back. So next up, um, we'd like to welcome Donna Lacey, uh, who is the manager of forestry and lands from Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority. Hey, Donna. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak and inviting Saugeen Conservation to, to join the workshop. This is a fabulous workshop. Uh, I'm going to ask that you please remember while you watch our video that our conservation authority, while it is the third largest, uh, we don't have any cities or large urban centers or other things that contribute to the assessment or, or levy coming in. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is that uh, what we do best at Saugeen is we get a lot done with very little. Our staff are very dedicated and without their devotion, we wouldn't be able to provide the public with the opportunities that we do. Um, our forestry and lands department consists of five full-time staff, seven contract staff, and 13 summer students. So that team's responsible for managing our fleet, our equipment, every property, all of our infrastructure that SVCA owns, aside from flood control. Uh, we just assist in the operation and maintenance of that. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all the staff that appeared in the video. Uh, it wasn't easy for any of them to do it. Uh, this isn't something we signed up for. Uh, although it's it's a pleasure. Um, so in the order of appearance, I'd like to thank Rick Robotham, Anthony Quip, Elijah Wilson, Lee Watson, and I have to thank Nancy Griffin, our education coordinator, for putting the video together and making some edi editing. We did just finish filming on Friday, so she got it on Monday to piece it together. So I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we're going to play it now, but just you know, we're going to play some closed captioning just because there are some audio issues. So some of the words that it kind of mangles, but hopefully it was kind of covered and you know, it was mostly the names. So we'll give it a go here. Thanks, Donna. I am Rick Robotham, Operations Coordinator, Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority. This park is Sulphur Springs Conservation Area. We acquired this property back in 1969 from A.J. Metzger. A.J. Metzger, his dream was to build a fish hatchery on this property. Unfortunately, the young fish could not survive due to the harsh waters of the Sulphur Springs, and his dream never came true. He built quite a few outbuildings on the property. One was a bird sanctuary. The bird sanctuary was in operation until 2018. Another building that we had on the property was his original cottage. His original cottage was destroyed by fire in 2002. Up to the time the fire destroyed the building, it was used as an education building. My staff and I operate this park year round. This property consists of 212 acres. So we have two fish ponds that now we house rainbow trout in. We find that the rainbow, the adult rainbow trout survive in the harsh sulfur waters. This is our quarter road system. It's 420 feet of boardwalk throughout the park. And it's one of the most pristine nature parts of the park. Labrador Key, natural orchards, there's tons of wildlife that roam free here. There's wild turkeys, there's deer, there's been a bald eagle sighting recently. In the early hours of the morning you can hear the owls hooting.
attraction of Sulphur Springs Conservation Area is the spring itself. The spring consists of an underground aquifer that flows at 27 bathtubs per minute consistently all year round. And it's a consistent temperature of nine degrees Celsius, so it never freezes. What this means for us as maintaining the trail systems, it's an endless battle of replacing boardwalks and building boardwalks and hazard trees because the roots are dying and so on and so forth. Hi, I'm Anthony Quip. I am a field operations assistant with uh, SDCA. Uh, I've been here for seven months. Uh, behind us is the old administrative building. Uh, we have since moved to a new administrative building as this one was no longer fitting our needs as we are growing. We, we now lease it to the safety village for children to come and learn about the community. Welcome to Soggy Swamp Conservation Area. Uh, this is one of uh, Soggy Conservation's big, uh, busiest campgrounds. Uh, we're located just along the Soggy River, just a few hours uh, or north downstream of Paisley. Um, uh, some of the highlights of our park is uh, what makes it unique is the, the equestrian campground. All right, here we have the Campbell uh, Horse Campground. It's the, uh, the equestrian campground within the Soggy Bluffs. Uh, there's roughly about 40 sites designated to equestrian. Some have corrals, some don't. Uh, so the, the Campbell was actually named after someone who helped us acquire the property in the beginning. Um, the sites are all unserviced up here, uh, and we've had equestrian camping since about around 2016. So in the Campbell, uh, all of our sites are unserviced. We do have three bunkies that are available for people to rent. Uh, the rest of these sites are just for uh, other equestrian users. Uh, we have the entrance to the trails up here, so all our trails are for hiking and equestrian users. Um, we have a group of volunteers called the uh, Friends of Soggy and Bluffs that help out uh, with a lot of our trail maintenance. So right behind me, we have the, uh, the Soggy River, which is a great place for canoeing and kayaking. Uh, just behind it, you can see what the, uh, how the park got its name from the, the bluffs as they are. Uh, tall clay banks. So here we have the entrance to the trails which are uh, enjoyed by hikers and equestrians alike. There's about over 10 kilometers of trails uh, with some great views of the Saugeen River and the uh, bluffs downstream. Uh, for wildlife we have lots of beavers as, as evidenced by the trees over there, uh, white-tailed deer, turkeys. Uh, the mature sugar bush is uh, home to lots of big pileated woodpeckers, uh, there's owls at night, uh, as well as lots of other uh, migratory birds. So here we are down in the Maples Campground, uh, just along the river on some of our night sites. Um, the, uh, most of the property is a mature sugar bush, so uh, early on the bluff was used for maple syrup production by Soggy Conservation. So in the Maples Campground we have about uh, 40 unserviced sites, uh, well, as well as about 90 serviced sites. Um, and as you can see behind me, there are some trailers from our seasonal campers uh, because we do permit winter storage for them. This is the uh, the main comfort station. Uh, it is equipped with uh, both men and ladies showers, uh, a laundry mat, as well as toilets and hot sinks. Uh, and the building was originally built in the 1970s, uh, but has just recently been retrofitted uh, to be accessible for all users. Hello and welcome to Durham Conservation Area. My name is Lee Watson. I'm the campground coordinator at Durham Conservation Area, owned by Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority in the town of Durham, Ontario. Durham Conservation Area consists of approximately 200 campsites, 100 of which are serviced with 30 amp service, with approximately 100 with the unserviced area, including two group camping for family camping. Durham Conservation Area has approximately 75 seasonal campers, uh, some of which have been here for 30 plus years. Durham Conservation Area also has a day use area that consists of two swimming areas. Here are some of our unserviced sites that are quite sheltered. Um, along with our service site, which is 
we have to clear some of the prime sites that fill in the conservation area along the Sogging River, which runs for approximately two kilometers along the length of the conservation area. This is McGowan Falls, or what we call the Durham Upper Dam. Durham Conservation Area staff, along with logging operation staff, maintain the three dams in Durham. The upper, the middle dam, owned by the Ministry of Natural Resources, and Poetry, and the lower dam. Durham Conservation Area has two activity centers, one seen here, and one at McGowan Pavilion on the Sogging River. This is our McGowan shelter. It's booked out to Camel Union and Camel Hawkins. Uh, this beach area is used primarily by younger families as we do have a larger swimming area where there's a dock uh, in the municipality of Western. This is our largest investment at Durham Conservation Area in many years um, for the park or playground for the young or young at heart youth. Welcome to Schmidt Lake part of the Greenock Wetlands Complex, of which Sogging Conservation owns about 8,000 of the total 16,000 acres of wetland. Schmidt Lake is one of the many lakes located within the wetlands, but it is by far our most popular uh, lookout point in Greenock. We an elaborate trail system associated with the Schmidt Lake property. Much of the trail system will take you through upland hardwood forest and some lowland forest as well. These forests are actively managed by sogging conservation, leaving good and healthy buffers along any wetland areas. Now at Schmidt Lake, sogging conservation is fortunate to own the entire properties surrounding Schmidt Lake. We have a viewing platform across the water there. And in 2016, sogging conservation was fortunate to, after 10 years of fundraising, to have raised enough money to put in this floating platform at the edge of the lake. This trail was located to allow visitors to see the plant life and a different view of the lake, meanwhile having minimal impact on the property and all of its inhabitants. The planning for this floating platform was many years in the making, as it was difficult to determine how we would ever put footings in to secure it. We then came up with the plan to use a dock system. As you can see, the system is made up of numerous squares all linked together. This was incredibly easy for our staff to install with minimal equipment as this site is difficult to access. From the platform, visitors can see pitcher plants and a wide variety of other plants not commonly seen outside of the Schmidt Lake area in our watershed. Hey, we're back. Donna, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, video Hi. problems. No problem. <laughs> That's all good. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, I'm so sorry about some of the closed captioning <laughs> errors. <laughs> I, I like I the crime site. <laughs> the crime site, sagging <laughs> lofts, <laughs> soggy bless. I, I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you I very know. much. Hey, your pl it looks gorgeous in winter, and and I've never seen a conservation area with horse camping before, so that was something that I was really interesting to to learn about. Um, so great job, and thank you so much for putting that together uh, for us. Um, it's great to see all your team involved as well. Some faces I haven't seen before at the workshop, so thank you so much for being involved. Okay, so our last uh, last quick commercial for you guys. Um, I'm gonna get it queued up here. Uh, it's Grumac Inc. Um, so please uh, enjoy Dave's radio voice as we acknowledge uh, Grumac's customized outsourcing uh, solution. Grumac is built on 20 years of commercial equipment, vehicle rental, and leasing experience. Supplying municipal, construction, industrial, and tradesmen in Ontario, we specialize in designing customized and flexible solutions for your business. Grumac understands that capital is limited, and buying equipment doesn't always make sense if there is no return on the investment. 
Instead, invest your capital in projects that drive a positive return. Grumac customers return because they know Grumac is not like traditional rental and leasing companies. Customers are treated on a whole different level. Visit www.grumacinc.com for more on how Grumac can help you. Perfect. Okay, so our final presenter today um, is Craig Mackin, who is the Director of Parks and Operations with uh, Conservation Halton. And with him, I'm not sure if she's going to be on the call, but a uh, heavy hand in the project um, put together itself is the Education Manager at Halton. That's Brenna Bartley, and she's also a committee member. Oh, hey. Hi, guys. Thanks you both for uh, for joining us today. No problem. Thanks, Tori. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. So so just to give a little bit of intro before we get into our video, um, just wanted to like everybody else thank the workshop committee. I know it's been a very, very busy year for everybody uh, and to be able to uh, to come to something like this, knowing that you guys have put in a lot of hard work on top of your daily duties uh, to make this happen. Um, you know, I, I'm sure I, I speak on everybody, but really appreciate um, the hard work that has gone into pulling this off together. So thank you to the committee. Um, so we, so what we've done here is we 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 worked with one of our partners, Greening Media, um, to put together uh, th this park to take you on, or this video to take you on a tour of all eight of our our conservation areas that uh, Conservation Halton owns and manages. Um, so we will, uh, maybe I'll kick it over to you, Tori. Um, but uh, this will just again take you on a quick tour of our eight parks and uh, hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Conservation Halton Parks. I'm Craig Mackin, Director of Parks and Operations. And I'm Brenna Bartley, Education Manager. We're super excited to take you on a tour of our eight parks today. All eight of our parks are located within Halton Region. We see about 1.3 million people annually enjoying our parks. We're going to take you on a tour, so let's go. Hilton Falls is probably one of the best places to go for a hike. You get to experience a whole bunch of different water bodies and different types of environment, different types of forest covers. It really is a really unique spot and it's very popular for the birding community. In the winter time when we've got some skiing and snowshoeing going on, it's a great time to feed the chickadees right from your hand. Another popular thing that as you can see behind me is the reservoir here which is very popular for fishing. We also tie into the region of Halton's forest system as well. So there's also a large trails back in there that is very popular for mountain biking. We do have a waterfall here. The name of Hilton Falls comes after Edward Hilton who opened a mill back in 1835. And the falls is what used to power that mill. It makes it really unique and uh, definitely the most popular thing at Hilton Falls. You can see behind me some of the fall colors have already started to change. Fall is the busiest time to come to any one of our parks. Welcome to Robert Edmondson Conservation Area. It's one of Conservation Halton's smallest conservation areas, but what it lacks in size, it really makes up for in peace and quiet. So the small reservoir that you can see behind me is very popular with folks who want to bring out youngsters to learn how to fish. Uh, it's also a wonderful place to lay down a blanket and have a picnic on a sunny summer's day. You can even go down along the edge of the water and take a look for frogs and turtles. One of the biggest attractions to Robert Edmondson is the 400 meter boardwalk, which runs through a wetland. And if you come out during May, bloom time for marsh marigolds is just a revelation. Uh, a sea of yellow blooms can be seen and are greatly enjoyed by hikers and photographers alike. Rattlesnake Point is one of the best places in southwestern Ontario for the view. The viewpoints that we've got here in the park are fantastic, and especially at this time of year with the, with the fall and the changing colors. So this park was opened in 1962. As legend has it, sailors, uh, when they came into port in, into Hamilton, would, would come up here for the day or, or, or for a night and they would see rattlesnakes sunning themselves on the rocky outcrops. Uh, and so that's how uh, one legend has it that we got our name of Rattlesnake Point. The other story is that from the sky, the escarpment looks like it's snaking along through here. So uh, we also get the, the Rattlesnake Point reference from, from that point as well. We've got about nine kilometers of hiking trail. There's also over 200 rock climbing routes. We're one of the few places in southwestern Ontario where you can do rock climbing. 
so it's very popular in the climbing community. We've also got a lot of picnic sites, a few campsites, and we're linked into Crawford Lake Conservation Area too, so you can actually hike right from Rattlesnake over to Crawford Lake. If you've got a camera and, and, and you love to take pictures, if you like to see the turkey vultures soar, uh, the viewpoints are really what makes Rattlesnake Point special. Mouseburg is um, a fairly accessible property. We've got really family-friendly trails, stroller-friendly trails. We have uh, a wide variety of uh, terrain and habitats to explore in the park to our reservoir that you can boat or fish on. Um, and then we have a lot of features that draw people in to visit us. We have our raptor center uh, with birds like my friend Shadow. We have our farmyard and our barn with our Percheron horses, sheep, goats, donkeys. Um, we really like to talk to people about some of the birds that they can find locally in this area um, and some of the effects that we can have on the birds, both positive and negative. Um, our birds that we have living here come to us in a variety of different ways. Basically, they're either birds that started their life in the wild, ended up injured, couldn't be rehabilitated and returned back to the wild, or they're birds like my friend Shadow here who were born in captivity and raised specifically for the job of education. So we run a number of programs here at Mount Spurg on a seasonal basis. Uh, so right now we are offering our spectacular Halloween event, which is a family friendly, um, slightly spooky evening event. Um, after spectacular, we'll be moving into our oh so popular Christmas Town program and maybe even meeting a special someone in a, a nice big red suit um, and getting a really great experience with your family that way. Um, and then Winterlit uh, is a, another really great evening program that you can come out, go for a stroll. We light up the woods and make it really magical. Um, and then one of our best known and biggest uh, seasonal festivals is our Maple Syrup Festival. Uh, so you can come out and learn how we tap the trees, turn sap into maple syrup, um, and hopefully if all goes as planned, enjoy it on some delicious pancakes made here at the park as well. So we have a really um, interesting historical connection here at Mountsburg, and you can see signs of the history when you come and visit the park. This property was originally settled by the Cameron family uh, back in the late 1800s. Um, and as you walk around, you'll see evidence of um, that settlement of the property from our old stone house that we have, some old apple trees that they would have planted. Then in Mapletown, we're actually using the sugar bush that the Cameron family would have used all those years ago. Crawford Lake's one of our most unique areas. At Crawford Lake, history and the environment come together. People who visit the park often come to take a walk on our elevated boardwalk that goes all the way around a rare Merrimictic Lake. And the lake is really unique. It's almost a unicorn lake. It's shaped like an ice cream cone, very deep compared to its surface area. And what that means is there's almost two lakes in the basin. And the lake that's at the bottom preserves history in its depths. And scientists from around the world come to study what you can find in the bottom of Crawford Lake. Researchers in 1971 discovered corn pollen in a layer of the lake from about the 1450s. And that evidence helped us find an archeological site for a longhouse village of 11 longhouses that existed here over 600 years ago. And from the 1980s until present, we've been reconstructing that village on its original site. So visitors who come to the area can actually learn all about the indigenous history of the land. They can also learn about the environmental history of the land, and they can just enjoy a beautiful walk through the escarpment woodlands. Another attraction that people enjoy at Crawford Lake, you can see behind me, is these beautiful chainsaw sculptures. We call this trail the Hide and Seek Trail. It actually takes you down to Crawford Lake and back up. There are 10 chainsaw sculptures that people can come and enjoy, and they're a representation of species at risk in our area. So a way for you to interact with the trail, interact with art, but also help people understand the importance of preserving these green spaces for future generations.
Welcome to Mount Nemo Conservation Area. Mount Nemo is very popular for hiking. It's very close to the city of Burlington, so it's a great place to take your dog after work. Uh, there's also about 200 climbing routes here too, so it's very popular with the climbing community. Probably one of the best parts of Mount Nemo is the view. And right now we're standing at Brock Harris Lookout at Mount Nemo Conservation Area, and it is spectacular views of the skyline of the city of Toronto, and on clear days you can even see the CN Tower. Welcome to Kelso Glen Eden, two parks operating as one. Um, at this location, we've got a ski area with 65 years of history now uh, and a four season park operation in Kelso uh, that delivers all sorts of trail attractions and recreational attractions year round. Kelso as a park offers everything from picnic sites and campgrounds to a challenge course, which you see behind me, a lifeguarded beach, a trail network with only over 30 kilometers of trails, uh, with a little bit of everything for people to enjoy. Beginner stuff for people that are new to biking and hiking, right up to some gnarly terrain that our most avid expert bikers uh, and hikers find to be a challenge. Glen Eden is uh, typically one of Ontario's top three in terms of busiest locations each year. One of the province's busiest snow school locations or destinations. We cater to families, we cater to beginners, intermediates, we do have a, an advanced and expert ski and snowboard crowd, but we are definitely known as a learning center. So in the winter, uh, you're skiing off of the escarpment. And so there's a lot of the iconic views of the escarpment in the background. And in the summer season, when you're enjoying Kelso, we have trails that work the way along that escarpment face. And then when you're on our challenge course and our beach, you've got some of those amazing uh, lookouts and vistas, vantage points that appear in the backdrop of your visit here to the park. Welcome to our newest conservation area, Area 8, formerly known as Kelso Quarry. A lot of the stone that came out of this quarry was what helped build the 401. A million tons of aggregate were removed from this site per year during its operation. Over 30 years of restoration work has gone into turning this into the space that it is today. It literally was, at one time, just limestone basin. And now you can see behind me, it's a thriving ecosystem. And that was done in partnership with Barrett Gold, Conservation Halton, bringing this space back to life. So what we're hoping to have for people here at Area 8 is a place for people to picnic, relax by the water, enjoy birding, fishing, boating, um, and just generally reconnect with nature. Thank you very much for coming on the tour with us today. We hope to see you in one of our beautiful parks someday soon. Craig and Brenna, thank you very much. That was a great video. Yeah, no problem. No problem at all, Dave. We, uh, you know, I think like a lot of other conservation authorities, you know, having video content that we can use is is a rarity. So, you know, that was one of the bonuses that the, you know, being able to present this at the workshop. We're launching a new website in the spring, so, um, you know, this 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 video is going to have many purposes. So it's kind of nice that that you guys kind of lit the fire under us to get this going, and uh, I'm really re really happy with the end product. Greening Media was was great to work with and uh, very reasonably priced. We got pretty pretty lucky with them. That's good. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of authorities would uh, would love to have a video like that to showcase their properties. It's a nice little introduction to uh, to those new people. And I know we uh, a lot of authorities don't have a problem bringing in the new visitors now because of what's happened over the last couple of years. But um, mm -hmm. it's still a nice little showcase for for uh, your park. So that's great. Thank you. Thanks, uh, and, and a thank you to all all the all the videos today, all the authorities. Um, everybody did a wonderful job, and it's nice to see um, such a wide scope of programs and uh, you know, interpretation ingenuity that's happening across uh, across the authority. So thank you very much for that. I know they took a lot of time at everybody's at everybody's days and, and work plans. So uh, we we appreciate the time that you spent for sure. So now for what we've all been waiting for, um, our, our raffle giveaway. So for those of you who stayed on, uh, thank you very much. Uh, a little background. Um, Bill Vanderlinden and NextGen Municipal have generously donated a hide bag for for our group. Uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, a lot of people on the call right now have um, have used NextGen for some of their products. Um, 
but uh, this is a, a great little giveaway for for somebody who's going to win today. So in the background, we have a um, a nice little random number generator that I've been using, and it is showing that number 111 is the winner. So I'm going to find 111 here, and we'll see who wins. So remember, you have to be on the call. So hopefully, Lauren McNeil from TRCA is on the call. Lauren, are you still here? Do we have a Lauren McNeil on the call? You can unmute. Show us you're here. Yes, she's here. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, this will go to you and, and your authority. And what we'll do, Lauren, is we'll uh, reach out to you after the webinar and get uh, get you in contact with Bill and, and NextGen and, and uh, get some get delivery of that uh, that unit out to you guys. Congratulations again, and thank you to Bill for donating. And next, we'd just like to take the opportunity to say thank you to all our sponsors. Um, our community of land managers cannot do our work alone, and businesses like those who have sponsored today play a key role in helping conservation authorities deliver conservation programs across Ontario. Whether it's providing benches, gate systems, reservation systems, garbage receptacles, docks, or fleet management, you're all appreciated, so thank you. Uh, this brings us to our committee. Our Conservation Areas Workshop Committee. Uh, the membership in this committee never ceases to amaze us uh, with their dedication, their participation, their professionalism, and their candor. Uh, their work as well should not go unnoticed. So for those of you who are not familiar, we're going to play a little video and introduce you. Tori Fisher, Administrator for Conservation Parks with Credit Valley Conservation. Liam Fletcher, Hamilton Conservation Authority. Superintendent of Confederation Beach Park. Mike Armstrong, Assistant Superintendent, Grand River Conservation Authority. John Massman, South Nation Conservation. Hi everyone, my name is Nikisha Mohammed, and I'm the Communications Officer of Conservation Ontario and a member of the TA yeah. Workshop Committee. Ryan Mackett, Lakehead Region Conservation Authority. Hi there, my name is Brandon Goods, and I am the Superintendent of Conservation Areas with Long Point Region Conservation Authority. Brenna Bartley, Conservation Halton. David Orr from Credit Valley Conservation. Dan Andrews, Lake Simcoe Conservation. Hi, I'm Zachary Cox, Marketing Coordinator with Long Point Region Conservation Authority. Thank you so much to all of our presenters and to everyone who joined us here today. Beauty. Okay. So thanks again, everybody, um, for participating. Uh, again, please direct any remaining questions you have uh, for our presenters. If they aren't in the Q&A, you can always send them to uh, the workshop email that you registered to, that's caworkshop at cbc.ca. We're happy to connect you with the presenters that you'd like to address your questions to. Um, and on behalf of the committee, Dave and I, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, don't be a stranger. We'll be together again soon, but psst, I have a secret for you. Uh, look forward to an amazing presentation uh, in early 2022. So you will not want to miss this. And we'll be sending out some communication shortly uh, for our newest uh, presentation coming out in the new year. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, presenters. Have a good day.